Herzlich willkommen zum Divock Panel. Welcome to the Divock Bridging Bubbles Panel. Uh, Jürgen and I are going to co-moderate and there's no breakout room or extended Q&A afterwards, so just um, ask away if you have questions. Um, there's a pad where you can ask your questions. Now I want to welcome the panelists. First, uh, Manuel Atok alias Honkase. You might have heard his keynote about um, war in Ukraine, bombs instead of cyber. Um, he's been working in information security for more than 23 years and he's concerned with topics like um, hackbacks or catastrophe protection. Welcome, Honkase. Next, um, I'm happy to greet uh, Peter Wächering, who's a science journalist and um, has worked in this field for more than um, 20 years and he's uh, studied philosophy himself. Welcome, Peter. So, Andre is not just the good spirit of um, our community, but he's also a data protectionist. And he lived uh, through the downfall of the Soviet Union, and um, he um, informed himself quite well about uh, this topic. And um, we're in a situation right now where many people are doing something, are becoming active. And we would like to show some perspectives. Well, this is going to be difficult um, to generalize. If you want to become active, keeping up means of communication is crucial for Example, journalistic work contributes to that, um, building bridges um, to Ukraine and Russia, and keeping up the crucial operations. There's a network, um, but it has become more difficult because some connections have been severed. And it's all the more important to create alternatives and keep them running uh, from the technical perspective in order to do something, become active and help uh, in these times of war. Honkase, anything you want to add? Yes. Something you can do very generally. Ukrainians have called for help um, in the cyber realm offensively as well as defensively. My recommendation, don't do that. Don't um, act against the population. Um, don't hack civil infrastructure. And this is not to um, downplay the war, but uh, this is just the wrong means. It's rather about supporting infrastructure in, UK, in Ukraine instead of destroying things with uh, brutal violence. So um, try to construct things instru instead of destroying them. You can also act as a point of contact and uh, you can also give counseling. Not many people may be able to do that on such a high level. To all the others, I've got Another t uh, tip. So, uh, if you just hack something because it looks Russian, and in the end you even um, hit or target uh, German or Ukrainian infrastructure, so my tip is be cautious, be sensible, 
kann recherchieren, ich kann suchen. Ich kann you can do your research. You can search. And you can um, contribute to informing people, creating awareness, reaching out and um, also um, counteracting fake news. This is uh, something everyone can do and that is really constructive instead of destructive. So, yeah, counteract hate speech and the propaganda machine. And if, if that doesn't help, just make memes. Because sometimes humor um, is also important because uh, the world is watching right now. The man will be punished in the end, but as long as the world is watching, uh, we need communication and we need awareness. So, the, uh, there's also a war in our heads, and uh, this is something you can also counteract with memes. Thank you, Honkase. This is a good keyword. Um, there was just this uh, Russian flagship that was uh, destroyed, and there was also a cracker meme. Andre, anything you want to add to that? Well, first of all, um, I agree with both uh, standpoints we've just heard from Honkhase and Peter, but it's also important. I may add that there is um, a civil society still in Ukraine. Uh, Russians have always been good at organizatia, but uh, it was still uh, each to their own and God for all. Today, within Ukraine, there's a lot of interlinks and networks, so there's possibilities within Ukraine. So um, don't, yeah, um, you can support them with uh, money instead of uh, buying drugs, for example, or medications. So, um, dedicated um, aid is uh, very good, but um, still you have to concentrate your efforts where they make sense and use your skills accordingly. So this is something else that you can do and also very important um, counteract fake news, become active uh, if you see fake news debunk myths, because so many people have no idea what is going on, and they just absorb any news they, good in, uh, they get in good faith, and sometimes you have to um, interact and intervene. Um, the, we still have a long way ahead of us in this um, regard. Thank you very much. So, I would like to broaden this first part. So, it's not just about um, acting against Russia, but also how can we use our civil means to help the Ukrainian um, people and also, secondarily, the Russian people. Um, we've talked about um, 
information and informing and donations. Is, is there anything else that we could do as CCC, uh, any structures we could uh, create? Andre, maybe. I don't currently have access to the Ukrainian civil society. There was a time when the idea was you could just uh, randomly choose a restaurant in Russia and then write something on their website. I don't think that that will work. And I believe that it really matters what happens in Ukraine right now. First, the people there do speak Russian and we can't. Then they know the system. And thirdly, I don't know what you could do otherwise, but what you should not do definitely is to dis or disrespect the Russians that are here. That is completely out of order. Um, whatever the name of the Russian restaurant around the corner, it's not their fault what Russia is doing. And to simply abuse these people just because they speak Russian is the worst thing you could do. So on the contrary, I know people here that are simply ashamed because they are Russian. You should help these people. You should stand by them and tell them that it's not their fault and tell them to cooperate. Do they have friends in Russia that you could reach out to? Is this, could you um, kind of help these people access the internet or something? But that's only the first thing. And then, but, but just to disrespect these people is, is the most stupid thing you can do. Otherwise, I have no other idea right now. Let's see what the others have to say. Well, maybe um, we could even extend this thought a bit and uh, maybe reach out to those Russians that want to escape from Russia or that have gone into exile already. And um, maybe some of these are IT people and they might have some things that they can use help with. <laughs> Oh, maybe they might need a visa or something, yeah. Uh, well, we are networked, we are international, and uh, I believe, yeah, that is something what you should do. Yeah, sorry. I speak a little Turkish, and I happen to be in Egypt at the time, so that's what I will do right now. Honkase, it would make sense if you could switch to wish to talk, because your background noise is quite strong. That would be great. Okay, I will switch off the microphone when I'm not talking. So I'll just briefly put in what I have to say, what I can say. First of all, Andre, very important, the restaurant thing. That was a, That's a good thought. But of course, a good thought badly implemented is bad. You, it, to inform is important. And the bad idea was to communicate hatred because that won't work, as you said because these people have been living off propaganda for decades. I was in the Soviet Union for a long time. And in the last 23 years or more than that, I have been in Russia and Kazakhstan for my job that I had for 23 years. And the people are having a hard time there. For decades, they haven't had a real life there. And they are being manipulated to the extreme. And to then just, you know, abuse people who happen to run a restaurant, that won't have any effect. If you write a restaurant review, that won't help at all. Ideally, you would put yourself into their position and then try to change something. So this kind of opportunism uh, went the wrong way. What you as a hacker could do, uh, one example only, what Snowflake does to help people reach, help people via Snowflake to reach free information from the Western sphere and maybe awaken them. We had pro-Russian people in Berlin, of course, yes, that happens, but that must not be representative of the Russian community. So, in that regard, 
you shouldn't tile all these people with the same brush. Thank you, Hong Kaiser. Peter, do you have anything to contribute from your current journalistic background? Another proposal, maybe. The snowflake is very important. Yes, that seems to me the preferred way of um, just keeping the contact going to colleagues, too. Uh, and we should do everything we can, as has been said, as Andre said, to keep the mood from tipping. Of course, it's dangerous to now portray Russia as the rogue state and, in extension, all Russians as rogues. The political discussions we've seen really shocked me. Uh, when the German Agency for Information Security warned people off from using Kaspersky software. That may be a point, but that doesn't affect Kaspersky as a whole. If they had been warning, if they had warned of any antivirus software, it would have made sense. But in this shortened way, it's, it's complete nonsense. And what I heard from colleagues was that a quote from Kostin Rayo, the analyst by Kaspersky, was rejected simply by the fact that he is Russian. So, are we now going to cancel this person? I ha there was a program when I included a quote from him where not many people contacted and said, reached out and said, why did you quote this Kaspersky representative? Are there no independent voices? But this is an informed person and he is independent and he's good. So we have to be very much, we have to very much promote a differentiated point of view. And we have to do the same in Ukraine as well, because the media in Ukraine that we had, even after 2014, before that it was very drastic, but even after 2014, in parts, was very much characterized by oligarchs. And here, it wasn't a paradise of press freedom either. You need to differentiate and look at the individual detail. That, I think, is a very important decision that we should take. Yeah, I think that at the moment, the most important thing is to avoid further polarization. There is this, this gap that should not be widened. I spent, I was in Russia only once. Six years ago, I spent a week in St. Petersburg. A friend of mine was with me who was fluent in Russian, and he was in this bar with me and introduced us and told everyone that we both speak English. And the first person that talked to me said the following, why do you hate Putin? So he didn't say good evening or anything. He immediately wanted to get into a debate about that. And that is a very widespread view, I thought. And that was my impression at the time. And I, as a German, a European, a EU person, I would be confronted with this prejudice that we would all be hating Putin and that we are the evil people and so on. So that as a precondition uh, was striking. And uh, how do we get Ukraine to win? And how do we stop Russia from existing? No, that's not it. The point, what you need to try is that to take a step back and stop hitting each other. And we can only do that by improving understanding. Would it perhaps help if um, maybe not those that do hacking, but maybe journalists or people that have contacts, maybe could they report more from Russia? What, uh, what voices exist there so that we hear more voices than just the official ones? I believe that is a bit too short. Yes, of course, it would help initially to report from Russia since the new media law is very difficult. So you have to uh, accept a few compromises. We keep experiencing that. And I think uh, this started much earlier. 
we note a certain tendency in journalism, and that is, for example, I saw that a very one-sided uh, so as I remember the election campaign in 2012, Putin put up large banners on construction sites in the streets. Whenever anything, whenever anything was reported, it was the great patriotic war that he was uh, doing his promotion with, and uh, this was kind of portrayed as a well, almost make Russia great again attitude, and that wasn't appropriate. And the tendency, <clears throat> um, we didn't really report about this very much in Germany. What happened in Ukraine after the Maidan protests, from which buildings uh, with, with which weapons people were shot at on the square, that wasn't reported on. In 2014, from Odessa, when pro-Russian activists in a trade union building, uh, were in a trade union building that was set on fire and many people died and others were beaten to death. Again, we didn't report on that properly. So we do apparently tend to, I've seen that now as well in this war of aggression, we seem to tend to simply put ourselves on that one side of the good and no longer report in a balanced way. And I don't know what to do and I'm kind of happy to be approaching retirement because I do not know how to correct this. I think we simply lost a lot of trust uh, what our, as far as our users are concerned, our audience. And of course, we could have now, could now raise a large appeal, please report in a more balanced way and take a closer look at the details. That wouldn't be a bad thing to do, but if that would help, I am not sure at all. Yeah, that's very sad, uh, but true. In, in many respects, we were kind of asleep, and uh, that is now coming back to haunt us. And uh, we have the, um, Germany has been very close to Russia, and, and we have overlooked Ukraine in the past too. And that again is a damage that is quite uh, heavy that we have inflicted on ourselves. But maybe we will be able to kind of extend our view and uh, maybe see, uh, can the people maybe see more and, and can we rebuild that trust maybe? Andre, you've spent a long time living in Russia. Do you have any ideas there? Well, Honkhase made this point. Uh, this is Honkhase, I would like to add another point. We have to accept... Does, does the audio work? It's a bad line. There's one point we have to consider. Peter is very, correct, very right in what he said. What I'm very angry about, quite recently I heard Annalena Baerbock uh, with an opinion and she was quite right in what she said but the old white men around her kind of ignored what she said and that is exactly what I as an expert have seen a lot. You can tell all the experts things that are logically deduced from expertise uh, and these people just brush it off. We have seen that in so many scenarios. When it comes to natural disasters, climate change, the question of oil policy, we have to reach a state to look at the causes and, and tackle them. And those that those that have expertise are not uh, considered and not regarded, and and others simply ignore what is said. So we, as a community, would like to make a change. So we should function as a community, and the community should listen to each other, and experts should be listened to. And on that basis, then politics should be made. That. 
th th that does not happen, I think, is a very bad problem that really should change. Thank you. Yeah, and I will completely agree with that. But I have to add that the biggest enemy is ignorance. And I see that we do not know much about Russia or nothing about Russia, and we see, I see that the Russians do not know about us. Jörg, you brought a very good, you've, you've mentioned a very good example. This is an absolute classic. When Putin had his appearance uh, in the stadium with the winter coat and all that, the Western media w was simply getting enraged about the cost of the coat that he wore and the uh, whatever price, price of other clothing that he wore. And that is completely off topic. Uh, the Russians see the Tsar or Putin. It's not a democracy there. So you have the highest representative, and he represents us all. To see what this man can afford and to attack this man, according to the Russian self-image, is completely out, out of sorts. Uh, he may talk nonsense, but um, the Russians don't know that we know why he is talking nonsense. So there's a huge gap that a lot of where a lot of work is required to overcome it. And uh, just as we have seen this with the old white cis men, we won't get rid of this problem. Peter is approaching retirement. I am, I am in retirement. Hong Kaiser, you have some time ahead of you still. So, joke aside, it's not a thing that you can do immediately. And there is toxic masculinity in Ukraine abundantly. If I look at the person that helps out in my household, um, I see that attitude. So it's not that easy. So it's not easy to simply solve it all in one go. There are many, many small steps. Take more interest, listen, build bridges between the communities. What we as a community could do is to try and link to hacker communities in Ukraine, in maybe Russia too, to promote understanding, maybe run an event together, maybe go to Donbass. Well, that would be dangerous at the moment. Maybe not now, but you know where I'm going. Um, I can see it at the border where I live, the border to Croatia. I was on holiday where the Italians were still the evil people. And if, if I go to Tyrol in northern Italy now, uh, the German-speaking region, uh, everyone speaks Italian. Rome is far away. We're fine as we are. And now I am in Corinthia at the border to Slovenia, uh, just behind the house. We have the border, which opened much later. So I am still being attacked in Corinthia because I was driving a car with a Croatian number plate. And uh, the re reactions I got in, in the capital of Corinthia, Klagenfurt. So this is not about Ukraine and Putin. This is very local. So there's a lot to do. Never let go, never relent, keep on pushing. And finally, perhaps, uh, I don't know if all the, everyone in the audience knows what Snowflake is. Maybe we should explain. Good idea. But I would like to first connect to the thought that you in, in, introduced. We can come to Snowflake later, because that is a question that we have in the panel description. Um, um, it's very hard to imagine with the aggression that we have right now. Um, how can we help to start a process of reconciliation? I thought the example you mentioned was very good, the Austrian example with the Tyrol in northern Italy, and we have a similar thing with France and Germany that we experienced. Uh, that they used to be arch enemies, and by now, um, um, uh, wait, well, maybe we'll have the elections soon, what will change there, we don't know. But, um, 
the, we have large partners in the EU and, and now and animosity seems unthinkable and a lot of things have happened on a small scale here. So uh, maybe we can start things on a small scale and as soon as the drastic situation we have now is over and, and the certain calm has uh, started, maybe that's what we can do. Yeah, I believe we have to start earlier. In this situation, we need to push that weapons are not seen as the only option. That seems to dominate the public discussion right now. But of course, next to defense and self-defense, those communication channels need to stay open and that talking must be offered again and again. And I think if we um, bring this into the German public, then NATO is also more pushed towards talking and have more activity and more focus on talks. As far as I know right now, in NATO, in the headquarters, nobody's interested in talking right now. Now the question is if talking right now and is possible right now. Of course, I am far away, but what I see is that it's just pro forma and Russia is not really interested. Yeah, that's what I read as well uh, um, when the Chancellor was there. But what my colleagues from Moscow told me is that public opinion, of course, just part of the public, uh, Russian public, it's just anecdotal, uh, anecdote. But what they noticed is that someone wants to talk to us. Not just weapons are sent against us, but there is someone who is interested in us. And that seems to be a start. Yeah, Macron also still had phone calls. In this context, we should say, well, with Putin, we apparently can't really talk right now. But there's more than just one level. And channels to the lower levels, his friends or, well, people that you might know in Russia, keep talking to them. I think this is way more important. The Russian leader, I don't think he wants to talk right now. He has announced it for 20 years and now he's just doing it. Honkase, you, did you want to say something? You look like it. Well, I agree with the two of them. It is critical to keep communication open. We can't just cancel it, that won't work. We have to communicate and exchange. And not communicating is also a form of communication and that's not helpful. So we have to keep talking. Otherwise, we'll just keep have to keep sending weapons. Well, the question that I'm interested in in this context is when do we stop talking? When is it enough? If civilians are shot in the open street, and as soon, as long as that happens, I'm not talking, that's a position that I understand. But it's still wrong. It's still wrong. Because there is 180 million Russians, and not all of them are in, the, in Ukraine and shoot. We can't annihilate Russia. That would make us just as wrong as they are. And the country has to be rebuilt and we will need the people and work. 
to stop talking to Russia is wrong, even if they are evil at the moment. We talked to other evil people before. If they give us oil or... Yeah. And we don't have to assume that in Congo things are better. But it's far away, we've never been there, they don't have cars, and they're not coming here with their children. So, no, that's not true, sorry. My emotion is overwhelming, but it's just wrong. No, I would also say, we have to keep talking and keep telling them that it's not okay what they're doing. And about the weapon deliveries, I would wish, I would hope, to think things through and to listen to the experts who say, well, what worth is a tank delivered to Ukraine without teaching them to use it and things like that. And we would have to teach people there, teach them how to um, to keep it in working condition and how we may be help, uh, just escalating the war and that's a discussion that's a bit ne uh, neglected in my opinion yeah I agree and I want to also to add to the point when do we stop talking I think that I get the intention but it should be the other way around we need to keep talking in peacetime and always. We need to stay in the discussion. If we don't do that, then we are also setting the scene for bad things to happen. So we can't ask when do we stop. We ha always have to keep talking. Stopping uh, communication is the wrong way. We always have to keep it. Yeah, just how you said. We need to stay in the discussion with all of them. We, we can pause other things. Uh, it shouldn't necessarily pause other things. Yeah, I agree. But right now, I have to deal with a huge group of 14-year-olds, 8th graders, and five of those tell me I want to go to Ukraine, I want to fight. <laughs> they only transport what their parents are telling them, or what they get from media, and that is, that is something that's promoted by the discussion of sending weapons. How do, and I wonder, how do we get in there to bring back logic and thinking and bring it back into the discussion? So we don't have to have this, these discussions here, but there, where it's happening. Yeah, there are options. You don't have to go to Kiev. You can go to Poland. My sister, her daughter, <laughs> they went to Poland and just take care of um, of animals, of pets, of pets that were left at the border. There are five million Ukrainians fleeing and there are people who are really suffering and need help. And they need clothes, they need food, they need help, they need uh, psychological help. You don't have to stay in Germany. But what do you want to do in Kiev? You're not a soldier, you don't know the language, you can't fight. It's absurd. Sorry. You just have to tell them it's absurd. Yeah, I think it's even more from what Joko told us. Putin has propaganda that dehumanizes. In Germany we had a phase as well where propaganda was pushed very strongly. Maybe we should work towards showing that yeah on the other side there is humans as well. You saw them as humans before, especially between Ukraine and Russia. Maybe we should focus on showing 
that everyone is still human and not everyone is Nazi or a bad person. Yeah, though I do have to say, I so told it yesterday before, when they say Nazi, they don't mean the same thing we mean. The Great Fatherland War is the Second World War. And the defense of the nation is, in this context, Nazi is a keyword for bad people that has nothing to do with a political idea. So, yeah, they have different definitions for Nazis. Honkase? Yeah, a similar idea. They have weird ideas or different definitions. They have a completely different culture. So I know quite a few cultures in Europe, in Israel, in the US, in Canada. And I was in Kiev a few dozen times. So some, sometimes they say the same word, but mean something different. And we have to synchronize and have to adapt to each other. What are we talking about? And we can not simply do that with the one person, with the one leader. We have to, uh, to do that with all 180 million. And that's what many people like to forget. Because of course, in Russia there are certainly a lot of people who have weird thinking and twisted thinking. But that's the same in Germany and all over Europe. We have the so-called Querdenker, um, anti-vaxxers and all of those groups. So before we can point the fingers and say, yeah, there's so terrible people over there. Well, so are here. There's fake news, there's algorithms dividing us. We have a pandemic. We are still in a pandemic and those two years caused a lot of depression and people are suffering still. All of us suffered a lot these two years. And now on top this war. So every time when there's a catastrophe, there's another one. So it's N plus one catastrophes now. And we have to work on those. But after all those catastrophes, if before we can master the situation, we need to have the discussion. What do we mean if we use this and that word? Because we want to live together, ideally. I, I would like peace for everyone, because it doesn't help anyone if we promote more weapons and destroy the world. There's the cyber war, that is none. Everyone talks about the cyber war, but there's rockets and bombs, there is Kalashnikovs and machine guns, we, and we keep talking about cyber war. That's the, oh completely different uh, wrong image so we need to get back to it to, uh, living together and discuss how to get the peace back and with the diff different languages and different perspectives that's a challenge but yeah we have to get started but I also would say we need to address the civilians who suddenly became olive green so, militarized version of green or pacifist, or supposedly pacifist, and suddenly support war and uh, support um, acts of war that can't be declared, uh, explained anymore. Yeah, and now there is someone who proposed that we should 
maybe think about a preemptive strike before Putin uses atomic weapons. But, yeah. Now, please tell me, tell me more about the people who became more martial. Yeah, well, I talk about, uh, with civilians. On the 24th of February, there was the attack and everyone was shocked, of course. And then people thought, well, what can we do? And then there was the discussion that turned from defense and simple defense weapons. And of course, there is already dual use. And then the discussion turned to weapons that the Ukraine needs at the moment to defend themselves or resist the attack. And then this uh, discussion about attacking turned to a discussion, well, we need win against Russia in this war. And I think in our civic society, we have to um, we have to think about what can we what can we really justify and of course we have to think strategically and we have to work with the politics but just as we for many years had this one-sidedness in the discussion that there might be people who are critical of Ru uh, Russia, not only in Ukraine, but other countries. And Russia was excused in many cases. Now the pendulum swings in the other direction. In 2012, I was beaten because I was critical of Putin because he was always referencing the patriotic war, the Second World War, in his election. And now the same people are arguing against me because I am saying, well, keep in mind that, of course, Russia has justified interests in this as well. And once it's no longer possible to talk about this, we are stumbling into... Well, I would quote it, we might stumble back into war. Well, yeah, but in this case, of course, other countries have justified interests in safety as well. Russia does, but other countries as well, and we have to consider all of them, Sweden, Finland, that they change their positions might be understandable even though that makes it more difficult for Russia. Yeah, definitely. That Finland changes position is completely understandable. But if we now think, yeah, we just have to beat Russia, then that moves in a bad direction, I think. An unhealthy direction. Yeah, what I think about this, and this is more the meta level, Germany has screwed up twice historically and of course that brings the discussion that we see internationally as well yeah we can't attack we are not able but we have to be able to defend but what does that mean we and Again, we need to be resilient, we need to be able to defend ourselves, we need to be on eye level. But that does not mean that we have to be able to attack. So, yeah, we are not attacking anyone. We are extremely, though, not extremely, but we are optimized on defense. But defense is also using weapons. And maybe we should bring this mindset to other countries. We don't have to cyber everything away and destroy all everything. Need heavy attack weapons, that's the wrong way. And I think Germany should have the role 
to say people we messed up twice and now we learn from that and you should as well and probably people won't say well Germans are so wise and Germany is so wise but we have this responsibility we can prove we have decades of history we did it like this why don't you and if people become a bit less offensive then ideally we might secure peace for decades and that would be a good thing for us yeah i agree in principle but at the moment a part of russia where uh, russia is moving into Ukraine aggressively, has invaded uh, parts of Ukraine, has committed atrocities, uh, which we can't um, judge before we've seen them, but um, they would need to um, take parts of the country back. No, it's defense, because they've been attacked and they are defending their territory up to its borders. That's absolutely legitimate. If um, parts of Germany were being annexed, we would also be in our right to defend those parts of the country. This isn't a contradiction. And I'm not talking about the current um, issue, but I'm talking about uh, well, in times of peace, uh, in times of peace, we have to make decisions and um, have diplomatic talks, uh, have preventative measures. This is what I meant. So, yeah, on the military side, you have to have the um, aggressive uh, potential. Um, it's, it's not possible. Um, no, uh, there aren't weapons that are strictly defensive, that's true. If I'm making a defense strategy, of course, sometimes you have to um, also be aggressive. But it's very important to keep in mind that this Ukraine conflict is not new. It wasn't created on February 24. We've had it for eight years. And in these eight years, we just try to close our eyes and not see this conflict. And there are possibilities to solve this conflict peacefully. And they've been, uh, those chances have just been given away. Yeah, um, some people are saying we've had uh, peace for eight years, not everywhere, but yeah, uh, peace as much as in Afghanistan, right? Yeah, that's. Um, well, we in Germany, we had eight years of peace. Yeah, we've had 65 years of peace in Germany, so it's unfair. No, there aren't purely defensive weapons. Ukrainians have to have uh, the possibility to take back their um, parts of the country that were annexed by Russia. But. Um, taking atomic bombs to uh, defend yourself, that's uh, taking it too far. Also with this discussion about arms, there are old NVA uh, weapons from the former uh, GDR army, and Germany is not hesitating to um, exporting weapons uh, that are old and used, but uh, not uh, new weapons. And also Ukraine took uh, more than 2,000 tanks from Russia. In Germany, we still have that uh, reflex from uh, the 30s that um, well, since 
Stalin. We know what is up in Russia. And you can see uh, how the uh, German Chancellor is hesitating himself. Yeah, you have to also look at the um, domestic situation in Germany. And yeah, you also have to look at the situation in Russia. When we're talking about sanctions, we also need to be talking about sanctions that hurt Crimea and that hurt Putin right now. And um, cutting off networks does hurt them. Um, but I've also heard uh, the argument that parts of Conti, of, um, that they're telling their friends that the ransomware business is um, going down. And this is an approach. This is an approach that we should extend. Well, if I was being cynical, I could say if we had an embargo on oil and gas, then, then well, people should um, maybe, uh, well, Germans would have to accept um, a speed limit and stuff like that. Yeah, I understand the thought, but if we're uh, turning down the radiators, we won't solve the problem. If we, you tell the elementary industry, um, well, uh, you need to be, uh, survive on less gas, so just um, maybe dial down the business a bit. So, our food production would be lowered. They uh, will have a lot of problems. So, we would have to create solutions now, find solutions now on how to prepare. And that takes us to the uh, issue of resilience. Re resilience means that you can um, resist and you need to build up the resistance first before you impose embargoes or sanctions and I'm still waiting for that um, resistance and resilience to be built. And uh, we're lacking a, a public discussion, discussion about that and a debate. I see another point there especially about the energy embargo that is proposed. If people here are affected, um, have to drive slower, which I don't have a problem with, or freeze in winter, which uh, would only affect poor people. Unfortunately, there are many voices um, that are identical to those who've been uh, very divisive before, and they're trying to uh, break up uh, mechanisms to, um, for example, the welcoming culture. And I'm afraid that um, our mood uh, might collapse like it did in 2015. So what can we do against that? Yeah, as Honkhase says, we need to build up structures, and this is not something that can be done overnight. And we need preliminary solutions. And we need to see what kind of sanctions we can impose with the intermediate solutions that we found. And this puts pressure on Kreml. So this uh, might be, uh, then we could maybe even uh, support um, producing less food. So we need to check the prerequisites for certain sanctions. And we need to see 
um, how we can bring that into the diplomatic discussions. And I'm quite sure that um, this um, the uh, people being unhappy, um, that is very uh, dangerous to Kremlin. Yeah, that's a great danger to them. I agree. Um, Andre, let me get off topic a little bit. You just used a word that uh, we probably all correctly understood. Yeah. I've been um, criticized by the community. I used uh, the N-word in the context of uh, Africa. And um, please uh, don't uh, understand that as my personal opinion. I was trying to imitate someone who would be saying something like that. Um, excuse me, I'm old. I might need some more time. Yeah, I would like to um, look at the resilience and structures and what we can do as a community because we are a strong community. Is there anything we can do or are we doing um, what we can do already? Um, well, of course there's things we can do. Uh, we can make ourselves less uh, corrupt or um, um, but so far that hasn't resulted in a better system for reporting security gaps. So we're relying on chance a lot. Honkaze, you're nodding. Yes, critical infrastructure um, isn't something that people uh, constantly monitor and keep in mind. But it's, it's all symptomatic. We should attack the root cause and why uh, there are um, s some mechanisms and infrastructures that can be improved on. I'm working with uh, critical infrastructures a lot and there's few people who um, really try and um, see how we can um, build autogenous infrastructure, for example, energy infrastructure such as um, solar panels. And it's, it's really expensive, but and it, it's really um, um, difficult to do that on your own. And there's very few independent energy um, production cycles in Germany. And a friend of mine said that um, sometimes um, batteries have to be added. And in case of problems, it's it's very difficult to debug and find the problem. And we shouldn't wonder why things like that aren't working. We haven't um, set uh, or built the foundations for um, autogenous energy systems. And we don't promote this kind of thing. Instead, uh, we're buying um, oil and gas for millions of dollars uh, from Russia and uh, then starting to invest in cyber war. So instead of doing that, um, we should be investing in resilient uh, infrastructures and uh, sustainable energy. So yeah, production halls, there's so many 
possibilities how they could be optimized with uh, sustainable and renewable energies. So uh, where is this progress? Um, because we need it. It should have been here years ago. We're just in a panel here. And to me, as someone who's um, concerned with that professionally, um, I'm speechless and I'm really annoyed how people are lining their own pockets instead of um, investing in the community. Well, um, sustainable uh, infrastructure doesn't have shareholder value, obviously. Yeah, and also um, we've um, accustomed ourselves to a certain carelessness. And the problem we're seeing right now, right now uh, we're very limited in our discussions because we're just talking about evil Russia all the time. So, no matter how the situation in Eastern Europe will evolve, well, before that, everything was well, right? Yeah, um, let's just forget about climate change as well, then. Maybe you can tackle the same, uh, more than one crisis at once with the same measures. Well, maybe we can even have a cyber war, but in reality, um, it's it's very different. But you're right; it's it's, it's a big uh, bundle of measures, and carelessness is um, truly the issue. Yeah, and this is why we have those problems, and this is how we got here, and we need to get away from here. It's those systems are so complex, and the sanctions um, against Russia are also uh, impacting ourselves. So, we, uh, we have to take into account how big um, the interlinks and um, the network it really is. So, sanctions will hurt us, and taking all of that apart, that's no longer possible. We can't um, look at it separately. Um, it is so enmeshed. We can't um, look at individual parts of the puzzle anymore, because there's black holes that might cause serious uh, consequences. Yeah, well, we could now think whether we should try to support transparency, in particular regarding financial transactions. And there's been a lot of sleeping in that regard, and many interested parties um, uh, to want, do not want that transparency. Otherwise, and of course, you could always affect both sides, couldn't it? And it's also the interest of the accumulations of capital that have grown and grown. That transparency will, does not happen. And these gaps are actively being created. I can ex I have experienced this myself. We have a renovation program at home and the windows have been replaced. And the replacement of the windows and all that, five different involved parties, and no one knows what the other party is doing. And uh, if someone does something that the other pa party doesn't like, then it all is brought to a standstill, and someone somewhere is responsible, but that person isn't reachable at the moment, and so on. And uh, it's this kind of Russian door system. Um, and now a lack of communication. And also the financial transactions, the, uh, that always leads to a situation of abuse of people lining their own pockets. 
and uh, people looking for control and power would will accumulate to more power and power in the end is always for sale and often people don't even speak the same language if i say i'm not going to abuse my power and uh, the other person might say um i don't know maybe uh, something i've maybe i've improved a little bit but this transparency of course would help and with a power transparency power structures cannot be made completely transparent but as far as possible you might achieve some kind of self-correction and work against the this escalating concentration if you look at trump i don't know i don't want to know what would have happened if he had been in power right now so again the power abuse of power and lack of transparency and people wanting to call in a commission first no thank you okay i would like to arc back to ukraine because we are ahead in time and see if there's any way that we can help civil society in ukraine or uh, something that is less critical of the system but more practical maybe there are approaches that you could mention peter you're nodding yes that is a good point so aid that is required and still being required and the people that have taken refuge welcome these people put them house them beat them and integrate them because this will not be gone in six months time that's the argument that i keep hearing this is no and don't restrict this to ukraine either these structures for giving aid and communication information apply these to the people in russia as well and and don't forget them yes and maybe we should in those last 10 minutes 10 minutes that we have maybe we should come back to snowflake i think that would be helpful yes okay who would like to start okay i will start leap ahead the tor network is a anonymization network that was created specifically to work in totalitarian states and let people communicate in situations where they would normally put themselves in danger uh, strangely financed by DARPA, which gets U.S. government money, but it's a tool of freedom still. But they do depend on, I don't have to go into the technical details, they do depend on many, many relays operating throughout the world so that you cannot recognize from outside from where the communication is coming. And these relays keep being attacked or blocked. And with Snowflake, this is a small extension that you can run with in your own browser at home. It's, I think it's has to be Firefox or a derivative, I'm not sure, but you can read it up in Wikipedia. This interpreter knows it can be Firefox or Chromium. You open a tab, let it run. It doesn't take away from you, from your experience. I have it open here, and every day I see between 10 and 20 people using my small snowflake at home and using it to enable their communication without people looking over their shoulders. Did I put it? Did I misstate anything? No, this is very true. Internet relations via Tor is the only way for me right now to communicate with people in Russia and get information from them. And it has also it also has to be said in Russia there still is a civil society that uh, can deliver videos or documents to us journalists so that we can keep reporting and. Uh, report about things happening in, in Bucha, uh, things that happen on the day of the invasion on 24th of February to actually investigate these things and to have clean sources and evidence. And uh, these people, of course, work 
uh, with a high risk on the ground there because many of the Kremlin people do not like people from do not like people uh, in their <coughs> government workplace uh, in the military for example who receive a video sending that on towards the west so you have to get the information out there's not many people that can do this but they still exist yeah it has to be said and we must not forget them and i think about 20 percent uh, a vague estimate and of course money 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 the whole thing costs money that has to be said these small infrastructures too so all the stuff that is being bombarded and destroyed there's no food no drink no clothing no diapers nappies there are no hygiene products for the women nothing so don't simply buy stuff and put it there give them the money because these people know what to do with that money i can only repeat money 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 sorry i can completely support that and you can choose which way you want to do this it's your choice there is the classical means uh, uh, which is still in front but still also the specific groups like medicine sans frontieres doctors without borders uh, um, I, there were more mentioned which I couldn't hear. Uh, so the the artisans, the crafts people. Sorry, impossible audio. So these people need money to um, do their work. And in doubt, if you know the people that live in Ukraine. Maybe send these people money, ask them. And almost each of these, everyone knows somewhere where money is needed. They may have an account. I was talking to the owner of an IT company, software development company, and uh, who is from Ukraine. And he had organized a donation account. And almost the whole company was giving money. They have programmers working in Ukraine. So they made sure that uh, their wages were donated so that these people could look after their families and, and get to safety. Uh, and uh, these people were not told not to program anymore, but, but to... Uh, and, and these people would also bring the aid into Ukraine themselves. So there is always someone who's right in the middle of things, not on the sidelines. and. Uh, if you do not have such personal relationships, donate to people that know where the money is needed and which aid is needed where. And this is about, there is the prejudice. Uh, if I give money, then someone will just put it into their pockets. Well, um, currently aid is needed and the only way to get it is through donations we have about five minutes left and i would like to give everyone a chance to uh, give a concluding statement and i'll start with andre okay so to conclude i would again like to apologize for the n-word it slipped out um, because i'm trying to be dramatic in the way i portray people and that wasn't good in this context that's the one thing and as far as Ukraine is concerned, it will not be resolved in a matter of days or weeks. It will be a long, bloody path. And of course, you will have to get rid of Putin in the long run. But neither, none of us here will be able to do this privately. Not Hong Kazo, not Peter, not me. What we talked about here is all important. These are all building blocks that are important. And uh, well, I don't know. If I were religious, I would ask you to pray. Um, just try to make the world a better place. Um, just be stupidly nice to people out there. If you hear people speak Russian, do not attack them, ask them, see where they come from. Maybe they're not Russian at all. Maybe they're Ukrainian, you may not know. So be a bit more aware, but be mindful. Thank you. Thank you. Honkase. 
I will connect to Andre. If I were religious, I would say, pray. Well, let's turn it around. If you don't pray, then talk to each other. I cannot repeat it often enough. Communication is key. Without communication, nothing will work. So approach people, talk to them. Uh, let's enter into joint action. Uh, give aid. Start an aid organization. There is a dynamic there. I have been involved in this. So get, get active. Talk to people. Approach people. Say, I'm doing things. I have reasons. And uh, that will lead to concrete actions. Maybe you can get some money transferred somewhere. And everyone might say, okay, great action. I'll get involved. So keep talking, be it on the political level, in diplomatic circles. Maybe uh, company uh, boards talking to each other and privately ex install Snowflake. Um, just the people you whose computers you look after, tell them, OK, I'm going to update your computer and install Snowflake on it and talk to them. And these people might say, oh, someone was thinking about the war there. I cannot say no to that. And that will trigger them and, and, and start them thinking and make them do good things. So I can only say talk to each other about the situation, do good things. We cannot undo what has happened. We cannot prevent things. But by talking about it, we'll keep it in people's awareness and maybe change the world this way. Yes, thank you. Peter. And please do not forget this war of aggression is not the only war that we have on this globe at the moment. Yes, very true. We have had this for at least 30 years. We've accepted this, and these are wars that are long, far, that are far away. Now we have a war in Europe, but let's remind ourselves of the Yugoslav wars. There have been developments that we simply looked away from, and we started defining the situation as normal for us. And maybe this is a point to start. This war could be used as an occasion to remind ourselves as civil society, if there is war, we have to get going with a long-term based politics to prevent further wars from happening. And that was not a party political statement. Thank you. Thank you to you three panelists, but there are more people out there that I would like to thank. And these are the very hardworking angels in the background. The fact that uh, there have been translations, uh, there, have, there was the co-studio in Hamburg, uh, and everyone that was working in the background, everyone that took place in the communication in the pad and helped us, inspired us with their questions. There's not going to be a breakout room and we will continue at a quarter to nine in 15 minutes with our evening program and that Aspeta Lars is, is working 3D. Okay. Thank you. A warm thank you.